Welcome to my YouTube channel. My guest on Facing the Canon is Greg Downs, evangelist and apologist. Greg Downs, welcome to Facing the Canon. It's great to be here. Thanks, John. Oh, Greg, we've been friends for 20 years. 20 years now. I was just working that out as I was, as I was driving down. Yes. And I joined the staff of St Andrew's Chorleywood. And we've worked together um, and we've ministered together. Yeah. Tell, well, it's about you. Tell us your story. When did you first encounter Jesus? Uh, so when I, I first encountered Jesus when I was a boy of 11 years of age. So I grew up in Lancaster, in Lancashire, and uh, not from a church family at all. My parents... Um, they, they divorced when I was when I was three, so I, I didn't know my dad. My parents split up when I was three, and I sometimes say that my mum she wasn't a, a church goer but a church sender. Uh, so she had three little boys. I was the middle one of three boys, and uh, she packed us off to church. There was a little church at the bottom of our road, and she packed us off, and that's where I heard the gospel. Now she wasn't very discerning, so it could have been the church of the Reverend Sun Young Moon. It could have been Moon, but it wasn't. It was in God's providence. It was a little evangelical chapel, and that's where I first heard the gospel. They sent me off on a camp. Uh, when I was 11, a boy of 11, and it was on that camp that I responded to Christ. Classic boyhood conversion, gave my life to Jesus Christ. And, uh, and count, looking back, sensed the Holy Spirit, of course, for the first time as I knelt and gave my life to Christ. And came back and said to my mum, I've become a Christian. And she's all oh, very nice dear, as if, you know, I'd said, I've taken up kickboxing or something. You know, she thought it was like a fad. Um, but uh, all these years later, I'm 52 now, that was, that was the summer of 1980, you know, still following Jesus and more in love with him than ever before. You eventually went into the ministry. How did that happen? So I, um, I was given a Bible when I gave my life to Jesus, and it's a children's Bible, and I've still got it at home. It uh, shows a picture of Jesus with the children on the front. Open the first cover, and it said, by appointment to King James 1611, King James Bible. Started to read it, didn't understand a word of it. And, um, and uh, so discipleship didn't really um, you know, kick, in, kick in that much. Um, I ended up going to um, a kind of a high church of England church called Lancaster Priory in my home city of, of Lancaster. And uh, they did, they, they, with, with kids, all they do is you become a choir boy. So I became head chorister and then an alt, altar boy. So I kind of grew up high church. And I, I planned on leaving school when I was 16 because uh, no one in my family had gone to university. I was from a working class background. And, uh, and I was praying, Lord, what should I do when I leave school at 16? And I, I woke up in the night when I was 15 and I sensed the Holy Spirit within me, all around me, and felt the Lord tell me I was going to serve him as a minister. And it was so completely alien. So I, I picked up my diary, I put, I now know what my career must be, I must join the ministry. That's what I wrote. Uh, 14th of August, 1984. Following morning, picked up the diary to think, gosh, it was such an alien experience, this sense of God calling in the night. Um, I, and I, I put a line through it, and I put, not possible. I put, um, and didn't tell anybody. Then a Christian I knew, knew, a youth pastor, had a word of knowledge and said, have you thought of going into the ministry? And I said, how do you, say, how do you, how do you know that? Uh, he had a word of knowledge and I was gobsmacked. And, uh, and he said, well, I think the Lord has asked me to ask you, have you thought of going into the ministry? So I thought I'd better do something about this. So I went to see my vicar, my high church vicar. And he sat where, you know, across from me were you in his black clerical shirt. And he, he had his half, half rimmed, half moon, half moon rimmed glasses on. And he said, why are you called to be a priest? So I told him, I, I thought naively, maybe this is how God calls his priests because, you know, this is, you know, the prophet Samuel, you know, got called in the night. So I told him the story. And I remember his half moon glasses went to the end of his nose and he leant forward and he said, were you ill? He said, were you ill? But that's how it, anyway, thankfully he put me forward um, for ordination, did university, ended up going to Oxford, lecturing at Oxford. This is God's sense of humour, isn't it? And then I got uh, revved up at 27. So 27 years of age, uh, 25 years ago, uh, uh, got ordained in Oxford Cathedral and have been, um, been a, serving God as an ordained minister this past quarter of a century. And... Uh, you have served the Lord in a variety of different places, theological colleges, churches, involved in parachurch evangelism. Mm. You have a great passion to do the work of an evangelist and as an apologist. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, so I, I didn't, I, I felt called to be ordained and uh, as I say, God ordained at 27, served my curacy, and my vicar, my training incumbent, quickly realised I was an evangelist in terms of an, an Ephesians 4.11 evangelist. So he made me the elder in charge of evangelism at this parish 
in High Wycombe. And right from the get-go, when I got ordained, I was doing itinerant stuff, getting invited to speak at university missions. And, uh, and that really, that, that has just increased over, over, over the years. Uh, th that's just increased and in the past few years. I've had far more invitations than I could do because I've been, as you say, working as a lecturer. As my last uh, position was uh, a lecturer at Wycliffe Hall, Oxford. And I was the dean of the Wesley Centre for Missional Engagement. So I was training vicars, a vicar who trained vicars, but alongside doing the work of an evangelist, of course, as, as well. And that's, that's just uh, uh, increased, increased more and more until now, as, as you know, I've just for the first time become a, a full-time evangelist from January the 1st. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Absolutely. I know that two of your heroes are John Wesley and George Whitfield. That's right. Tell us a little bit about their story, Greg. Uh, so Wesley and Whitfield are heroes because they were both uh, Anglican clergy, uh, but also Oxford based. And uh, I was ordained at Oxford. Uh, I got married at Oxford at New College Oxford. Uh, I've been a chaplain at Oxford. So I've got, I've got a lot of Oxford connections. And uh, so uh, Wesley and Whitfield. Whitfield was, was at, um, at Pembroke College where I was the chaplain. And uh, he was actually, he had his spiritual awakening when he was at Oxford. And um, one, of the, one of the narratives says how he danced down the stairs and gave thanks to God in the college chapel, which was then St Aldate's Church, because the college chapel wasn't built in Pembroke. St Aldate's was the, was the college chapel, which I was later on the staff of. So, uh, so that's where, how Whit Whitfield uh, came to Christ. I love Whit Whitfield. Obviously, he was a great uh, theatrical preacher. I, lo I love his turn of phrase. He was a great communica communicator and, un uh, and unafraid to be a bit, 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 bit different and a bit And bit it theatrical. was said that he was the divine dramatist because yes, there right. was so much drama yeah. in the way yeah. he communicated. Yes, yes, absolutely. One of my favourite stories with him is, I'm not advocating this at all, but he was preaching on the second coming once. Uh, uh, when the final trumpet would sound and he, he got a friend it was an open air preaching and he got a friend to stand by a tree and uh, at the culmination of the sermon when he said about jesus coming in glory to judge the living and the dead uh, his friend then went da, da, like this and he said look i hear it it's the eschatological trumpet you know it's the and people started crying and weeping and gave their lives to christ now obviously the bottom by what we think it was that slightly manipulative but it's, it was just he had this flair and this touch of of, of theatre and he, he was a visual preacher he was a visual preacher so he was he was great Wesley he was more of a slow burn obviously he wasn't converted when he was at Oxford he was across the road at Christ Church and uh, was ordained first before he had well, you, before he had his spiritual awakening and uh, he went to a the, to be a missionary in America but in his diary wrote I went to convert the Americans but who oh who will convert me so he knew deep down that he didn't have personal saving faith even though he wouldn't have articulated it like that then of course his oldest gate experience when he was in London I went to a meeting of the Moravians and uh, Luther's preface was uh, read out. To the Romans. And, and, uh, yeah, to the Romans, to the, the Luther's preface to the Book of Romans. And it's a great one to think because Luther was uh, long dead, of course, the great German monk reformer. But though he is dead, yet he still speaks. So, you know, 200 years later, of course, Wesley hears it being read out. And the famous thing, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I knew that Christ, he died for me and me alone. And, uh, and that was his, his, his spiritual awakening. That's when he was born again, post-ordination. And uh, of course, the rest is history in terms of uh, the Methodist, the Methodist movement, which really led uh, led a revival within this nation for a hundred years. It wasn't just a quick flash in the pan. Um, you know, the, the the influence of Wesley, um, particularly in this nation, Whitfield more in the states, but uh, but but uh, was it was immense. So the, yeah, there. So they're my here. So I was ordained on the spot. Wesley was ordained. So he was ordained at Christ Church Cathedral. And when I was ordained, I audaciously prayed, Lord, give me a double portion of his spirit. Now, I know some people think, what a crazy prayer. And of course, God hasn't answered it yet. But God isn't blessed by our small British prayers, I think. And that's my prayer. Lord, make me like a, like, like a Wesley. You know, I want to preach the gospel in season and out of season and see people come to faith and transform by the gospel. The gospel that they preach, Greg, and the gospel that we preach is sometimes misunderstood and sadly, we don't always communicate it clearly. And sometimes we should be helping people to come to faith, but we seem to be hindering them. Mm. How would you articulate what is the gospel? The gospel, it's amazing, isn't it? The, the gospel, the answer to that, uh, you know, could, could be a two hour uh, lecture. Some people say that the, 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 the book of Romans is the gospel uh, in miniature. We could say that a verse is the gospel, obviously John 3, 16, God so loved the world he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Um, and the gospel uh, could just simply be one word, Jesus. Jesus is the personification of, of, of the gospel. 
but uh, the, you know the gospel we could we could we could uh, summarize it in soundbite form or, or longer but uh, you know there are gospel sound bites verses like you know the son of man came to seek and to save that which is lost that's the, the gospel in 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 essence i sometimes uh, say if a, a little th- a three point things we want to re- reduce it it's it's god formed us sin deformed us but christ transforms us so it's the fall first of all it's bad news before it's good news well first, first of all it's good news to start with god formed us god god is our creator god he created us in his image in the image of likeness of god yeah, of god but then sin deformed us actually uh, because of uh, sin that affects the whole of humanity, uh, we're living apart uh, from from God, and the, all the consequences of that we see full well, don't we, in the world around us? But then Christ transforms us. Jesus Christ, y- Yeshua, means God to the rescue. That's what it means. Yahweh to the rescue. God came to our rescue in Jesus Christ, uh, so that we might know Him, be reconciled uh, to God the Father, be transformed, but then be agents of transformation. So one of the great things with the Wesleyan revival was, of course, societal transformation. It didn't just stop with individuals. Uh, giving their lives to Christ, but society itself was transformed. That's what I long to see today in this nation. And, we, and boy, we need it, don't we? We need it so much, Greg. So how do we connect with Jesus? How do we actually become a child of God? Um, it, I was asked that question. Just I've just been up in York uh, speaking at the Christian Union there. And on the way down, driving back from York to Oxford, um, my wife was expecting me about midnight. She was already going to be in bed. I didn't get past didn't get home way past midnight because I called in to get some petrol. And um, I thought it was just gonna be five minutes getting this petrol. I was about an hour in this petrol station. I went in, there were these two ladies behind the counter and I was wearing, as it happens, my clerical collar. I sometimes wear, it's great for evangelism wearing a dog collar, clerical collar. And uh, I told this lady I'd been up speaking in York and it's really odd, this doesn't happen, hardly happened at all. As I was speaking, one of these ladies began to cry and she said, I don't know why this is happening. This doesn't normally happen. And she went to the back room because she was crying. So I talked to the other lady who said, oh, normally I'm bored by religious people. But she said, you're interesting. And I said, OK, fair enough. And, um, and then they, they asked me questions. She came back. The other lady came back. They asked me question after question. And I talked about, obviously, I talked about the presence of God and how in prayer, I you know, sometimes sense the presence of God. My eyes fill with tears. And she said, how come I've never experienced the presence of God? And I said, have you given your life to Christ? She said, no. Uh, and I said, look, would you like Would you like to? And she said, yes. Yeah. So I said to the other lady, would you like in on this? And she said, yes. Yeah. So I, I prayed for them both there and then. They were behind the counter, this COVID perspex glass screen. Uh, but God, God, that's no barrier for the Lord. And they both gave their, they both gave their lives uh, to Christ. They both so received Christ. They both received, they both received Christ. So you and they explained were a little about that. Well, I was there for an hour. I was there for an hour. So I, sh- I shared the gospel using my testimony and John 3.16, as it happens on that occasion. And what happened? And, uh, and they both they both wanted to uh, give their lives give, give their lives to the Lord, and they were touched. They were touched by the Holy Spirit. I always pray that that people will be touched tangibly by the presence presence of God. But Tom Wright, who's a, a colleague of mine, has been a colleague of mine at Wycliffe. He says that repentance and faith is the light motif of the gospel. Very Tom Wright type phrase. But he's right. In other words, the distilled essence of the gospel is turning from and turning to. So that's what I did. I'm not into easy believism. Sometimes you get people say, just lean into God or just, well, yeah, fine, lean into God. But it's repentance and faith. We need to turn away from sin, that which is wrong. Uh, Hermotia, the Greek word, that which falls short of God's standards, which is perfection. And we need to put our faith in and upon the person of Jesus Christ and his atoning death on the cross, of course. And, um, and so that's what I did. I led these ladies to, to turn from their sins uh, and to trust Jesus Christ as the, the hope uh, of the world, their hope, their personal hope. And, uh, and they were, they were, touched by him and they experienced the presence of they the did. lord they did they experienced the presence there and then in the motorway service in the, the the petrol station on the motorway halfway between oxford and york uh on a friday night yeah so. if there's anyone listening now greg who doesn't know jesus but would really like to know jesus would you lead them to receive christ now yeah m- uh, most definitely so uh, you know, th- that verse that I used, um, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's about, it is, it, it's about the love of God. Whatever you've been told, God loves you. God is love. Love isn't merely a quality God possesses. Love is that which is his by his very nature. And he loved the world so much he sent Jesus, his only son, uh, to this earth 2,000 years ago. Uh, so that we might be free, so that we, as, as the verse says, that whoever believes in him, that has faith in Jesus Christ, will not perish. Perish 
uh, means living a life of separation from God. And if we don't know Christ, we, have, we live a life in this world separate from him. And that goes on into eternity, which is called hell. That's what hell is, separation from God. But it's possible to be reconciled, to know God, to be friends of God in this life if we simply turn to God and trust God's son, God's messenger, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth to rescue each one of us. That whoever believes in him should not perish, should not be separate from God in this life and for eternity, but have eternal uh, life. So I'm going to simply uh, uh, pray. And the prayer goes like this. Thank you, God, that you sent Jesus to die for me. I trust in you. I put my faith in you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I might know you in this life and for the whole of eternity. So here's the prayer. Uh, and you want, I'm just going to pause at the end of each line. And wherever you are in the world watching this, if, if you want to have a friendship with God, if you want to know God like these two ladies in the petrol station that I prayed with on a Friday night, just simply make this prayer your own. Just pray it with the faith that you have. All it takes is a little bit, a mustard seed of faith, says Jesus, and God will uh, come into your life. Uh, so uh, here's the prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to die for me. Jesus, thank you that you are God's gift. I turn from my sin to your son, Jesus Christ. I turn from everything I've said wrong, done wrong and thought wrong. I turn to you. Jesus, come into my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. May I serve you, Jesus, from this moment for the rest of my life. Use me, I pray. Amen. And Father, I pray for anyone who, who prayed that prayer just now, wherever they are watching in the world. And I pray now that you fill them with your Holy Spirit. I pray they won't just uh, end by praying this prayer, but this might not be the end, but the beginning of a life in you, that they may grow up, I pray, into the full measure of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Just like a, pl a, a plant uh, needs air, light and water, Lord, they need three things to grow, to pray, uh, to read your word, the Bible, and to, mi to meet with other Christians. And I pray that for them, Lord. And uh, so uh, my prayer is that uh, you might grow in, in prayer, the Christian's vital breath, just using your own words, that you might read the Bible. You can just get one online quite cheaply and that you connect with some form of uh, faith community, a local community church, uh, other Christians that can encourage you in your walk of faith. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Greg, very much. My and pleasure. can I encourage you, if you did pray that prayer, to get hold of a Bible and uh, to read those Gospels, those four accounts in the New Testament about the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and to do what Greg has encouraged us to do, to pray and to meet with other Christians. Find a good local church that loves Jesus and worships Jesus. Greg, you are an evangelist, both publicly and personally and uh, you're in the middle of moving home and even the removers came yesterday to pack your books from your study. Tell us what happened. Yeah so I, I had my last day at Wycliffe Hall Oxford. I've been the missions tutor there and uh, was moving on and it was a bit it was a poignant day going. It's always poignant moving from one job to the next and these men they were to, spent about two hours in my office packing all my books and my furniture away and as we went in one of the removal men, James, he saw a picture which was Christ on the cross over the world by Salvador Dali. And he said, oh, he said, uh, Jesus on the cross. And I said, yeah, do you know who it's by? And he said, Salvador Dali, he knew it was. And, and I said, are you a Christian? He said, no, I don't, th I don't think so. I believe in God, but I don't think so. He was 31. There was a younger guy called Jay. And I said, are you a Christian? And he said, uh, there must be something there. And I get that all the time, John. There must be something there. He just never heard. Nobody had told him, but there must be something there. It says in Romans, doesn't it, that creation itself testifies to the presence of God. So I said, look, I'm a vicar. I sort of go around the world telling people about Jesus. I train vicars here at this college or have been doing. I said, look, you can ask me any question you want and, uh, and I'll, I'll try and answer it. So for two hours, they, uh, every question, you know, why does God allow suffering? Of course, the Odyssey, that one had to be in there. Question after question. And then anyway, after this, I said, look, would you, do you want to give your life to Christ? And they both, they both did. Both, both men, they bowed their head and I led them in prayer. They both prayed out loud and received Christ. And I thought, the kindness of God to these two men, but it was a lovely way to finish as the missions, missions tutor at Wycliffe, that my final act, so to speak, was share the gospel in my office and lead these two men to, uh, to the Lord. Well, the Lord has led you on. The Lord guides our steps, Greg. He also guides our stops. But 
you've had a wonderful ministry in so many different places, but now a new ministry is being birthed and it's called? It's called Kingfisher Ministries. And uh, so from January the 1st, uh, I'm working for a trust. Um, you've encouraged me to do this for years, John. Finally, listen to your advice. So working for Kingfisher, Kingfisher Trust, and uh, I'm gonna be based in Whitney, which is eight miles west of Oxford. My wife sensed uh, the Lord gave her that name in the night. And uh, obviously Kingfisher is a beautiful work bird, but uh, you know, I'm a fisher for the king, a fisher of men and women. But also, well, I never forget as a, as a kind of, as a good Calvinist, if that's not a contradiction in terms, that God is the great evangelist, he's sovereign. I know we, we and I both believe in the sovereignty of God, that great book by Jim Packer, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. So uh, Jesus calls him the Lord of the Harvest, one of my favorite titles for God. Pray that the Lord of the Harvest. And so he is the, the great fisher king, isn't he? I'm, I'm a fisher for the king, but he is the great Fisher King. And so that's the, that's the trust that I'm going to be working for that's going to set me free to do f f four things. One, to do evangelism, which is like I've been talking about. Uh, do, two, train the church in evangelism. The whole church, we're all called to be witnesses, even though we're not all ev evangelists in the Ephesians 4.11 sense. And the third one, um, raising up an army of evangelists. And the fourth one, mentoring leaders, mentoring and coaching leaders. And I do that for vicars and culture shapers as well as um, evangelists. But that third one, I've really got a heart for that one because I think, as you would agree, many evangelists uh, are not discerned. They're, they're up and down the land in our churches, and uh, an evangelist often doesn't work for the church. It's often best that they don't, uh, and they sometimes uh, will never preach. They might just gossip the gospel, but vicars, a lot of pastors fail to recognise the evangelists in their midst. And sometimes when they come forward, pastors are threatened by them because they come and say, vicar, can we do this in a coffee shop? And the vicar's a bit threatened and sits on it. And so they, they're undiscerned, these evangelists, up and down the land. There's a handful in every church, I think. So uh, one of my roles, I particularly want to... Uh, the phrase I got from the Lord was raise up an army of evangelists, an army of Ephesians 4.11 evangelists. So I'm, I say to vicars, you know, invite me in and uh, hopefully I'll try and discern people who are evangelists and maybe get them together in a group and I'll come in maybe once a year and train them so they can be then set free. So the phrase I want to use, I want to discern them, disciple them and deploy them. And so, I, you know, the old thing, teacher, give a man a fish, teach him for a day, uh, teach him to fish, feed him for a lifetime. I, I don't want my ministry to die out whenever, whenever the Lord calls me home. I want my legacy when I finally go to... Uh, give up the ghost and go, go to the Lord um, to, uh, to have, have uh, trained the church in evangelism, but also raised up an army of evangelists, women and men, of course, it's, it's, there's no gender tie to it, women, women and men, to, to be Ephesians 4.11 who, evangelists, who in, not just lead people to Jesus, but they themselves equip the saints for acts of service. They equip the church for evangelism and reproduce themselves as well. What, what's your sense, Greg, as you look at the world, as you look at our nation here, What's your sense with what is God saying, God doing mm. post these two COVID years? Yes, yeah, no, it's a very, very good question. I, like, like all Christians, I, I prayed a lot about this. I think, you know, I, I find it difficult when I see Christians in despair because I don't think we, we're not called to despair. We're called to be a people of hope. And when COVID happened and, you know, when the prime minister said it was going to go in six weeks and, of course, it's mutated into different, uh, different uh, variants, you know, did this catch God napping. Well, of course it didn't. God is sovereign. Now, it doesn't mean he caused it, of course not, but he allowed it. It's, my theology is that, that all things happen within his permissive will, uh, even if he doesn't cause things. And, uh, and so why has God allowed this in his sovereignty? And I think partly it is, it is to shake up the church. So it's, it's a call for the church to respond to the hopelessness all around with the gospel of hope. And I think it begins with, with us. So I think people often say, let's pray for revival. And I do. I pray for revival for every town or city that I've ever lived in or ministered in. And uh, that includes Chorley Wood, lived, lived, lived here. I pray for revival everywhere I've lived. But actually, the church often is, is in such bad nick at the moment. Not completely, of course. I don't want to be pessimistic. But, you know, where Christians have given in to despair and hopelessness, they've diluted the gospel and they've bought into theological liberalism. It's no wonder we're not going to win the world for Christ if the church itself isn't ablaze with the gospel of Christ. So I sometimes say we need renewal. Sorry, we need reformation before renewal, before revival. And so I sometimes say, you know, church says we need renewal. And, uh, but but it, there's no renewal before reformation, reformation before revival. So reformation, we need to get back to apostolic, biblical Christianity, dis rediscover our confidence in the gospel, the euangelion, that is the power of God to everyone who believes, and, uh, and, and live passionate, radical, sold-out lives for Jesus Christ. Then we'll see renewal. Jesus in my heart, renewal in my life, renewal in my church, my local church. And then we'll see revival. We'll see an exponential returning of the nation, hopefully, pray God, to um, to the biblical, to the biblical gospel. So actually, um, what's my, what's my thing? I, th I think there's uh, there's a lot of hopelessness around. 
I think the church needs to rediscover its confidence. We need to see this, this reformation before renewal. But actually, I'm optimistic. And I say, I say to Christians, look, even if your denomination goes apostate, and one of the hallmarks of the end times is the, the apostasy of the church, and there are many people. And what, get... what do you mean by that? The apostasy well, the apostasy of the, of the church, church is, is where the church has the appearance of godliness but denies its power according to the scripture. So in other words, it looks... It looks godly. In other words, you might, you might, there might be bishops and priests who look religious, but actually they've moved away from the apostolic gospel. So, um, so actually, we, we are seeing in part, I do think, the apostasy of the church. You know, when denom- whole, some denominations wholesale move away from the biblical gospel. But I say to people, don't be discouraged by that because God deals with individuals. And um, uh, and Smith Wigglesworth has always been an inspiration to me. He was a Bradford plumber, as you know, who was an amazing evangelist. And I think, Lord, if you can use a Bradford plumber, you can use a Lancastrian son of a cleaner because uh, I came from a working class background, you know, you can use me. And uh, he's a great inspiration. And, uh, and, and, you know, that thing, Lord, send revival, start with me. So I, I pray, use, using Smith Wigglesworth as an example, I say, Lord, make me a one-man walking revival centre. And you know, he will, even, even, even if, you know, there's, there's, you know, people are not following Christ. Well, you know, let them, in a way. I mean, but, but you, it's, it's, you, God will deal with you as an individual. And, and, and he, he did, he's done it in the past. And so, so I, that's my prayer, Lord, make me a one-man walking revival centre. Obviously, I want to walk, 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 work corporately, collectively with the church. I'm an Anglican clergyman. I've, I've, God hasn't finished with the C of E. I'm committed to the Church of England still, uh, but I'm not going to compromise the biblical gospel. And, uh, and so uh, you know, here I stand. I can do no other. As, as Luther famous, famously said, we need to uh, stay within the, the way of God. That's what the early Christians were called, weren't they? Followers of the way. We need to stay of the, the way of God. And of course, that means the way of the scriptures. There's no, there's no Christ without uh, the, scri- the scriptures in the sense the only Christ is the biblical Christ. And uh, to be so filled with his Holy Spirit. I pray every day, prayed it in the car, driving down today. Lord, fill me afresh with your spirit. Uh, Lord, that uh, that I might just radiate Christ, and because uh, the best evangelism is from the overflow, isn't it? You and I know that. It's not evangelize, evangelize. You know, you don't guilt trip. We don't guilt trip trip people into the kingdom. The best evangelism is from the overflow. So, so we're so filled with the Holy Spirit that we just can't resist giving it away because it oozes out of our every pore. And that's my prayer for me, and uh, you're my inspiration because you're, you're you're a man of God on fire. Wesley's phrase, remember, I set myself on fire. And people come and watch me burn. And that's what I'm not, I've said that a hundred times. And look, I'm, I'm welling up saying it now. I've said it a hundred times. I, wa- I set myself on fire and people come and watch me burn. I want to be a burning one, John. A burning one. Uh, with my heart ablaze. My mind informed, but my heart ablaze with the love of Christ. That men and women might come to know this Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth and the life. I love, Greg. I love your passion for Jesus. I love your passion for the Holy Scriptures. And I love your compassion for lost people. Keep on keeping on. Thank you for joining us on Faith in the Canon. I hope that has inspired you. It certainly has inspired me. Yes, indeed. Let us have a baptism of his fire so that we can shine for Jesus. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.